Aloha everyone, I am Chaplain Stephen Chapman and I'm the Command Chaplain for District 14 here in lovely Honolulu, Hawaii. And we are here at the historic Diamond Head Lighthouse as we video our special Easter service this year. Usually we would have several hundred people gather here together on this beautiful lawn below the lighthouse as we celebrate our Christmas Eve ceremony and our Easter service here. But this year is kind of different for us due to the COVID-19 pandemic that our world is currently fighting together through. And so we know that these are difficult and uncertain times. So it's a very special honor for us to be here that we can celebrate together this Easter service with you. Around our nation and world, Holy Week may not feel the same for you. We may not have the opportunity to join together in normal ways as a church family. But I am grateful for the technology that God has given us to put this very special service together for you. And so now it is my honor to introduce our District 14 Commander and his lovely wife, Rear Admiral and Mrs. Lundy. Aloha. Half a day and good morning. I'm Rear Admiral Kevin Lunday, the commander of the 14th U.S. Coast Guard District. And I'm Linda Lee Lunday. Happy, Happy Easter. Easter. Welcome to historic Diamond Head Lighthouse here in Honolulu, Hawaii, where today, Lieutenant Commander Stephen Chapman U.S. Navy, our 14th District Chaplain, and Chaplain Vicki Lepic, Coast Guard Auxiliary Chaplain, will celebrate this virtual Easter service. Now, it's a very long-standing tradition for Coast Guard families to gather here at the Lighthouse every year for Easter service, but this year we're going to have to celebrate differently. And although we can't be physically together, we are not alone. And as you watch this, no matter where you are, even if you're by yourself, please know that you are not alone. And as the storm rages around us, we are not afraid because we are filled with a certain hope for the future. To the men and women of the 14th Coast Guard District and to your families, thank you for your continued service. May God be with you. Semper Paratus. Our reading today is from John 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. 
he bent over and looked in at the straps of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to the Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told him that he had said these things to her. Dear Lord, on Easter morning, we ask that you bring us into new life with you, filled with belief and faith. Let us show our renewed faith by being a light to the world, showing kindness and love in this hard time. In Jesus' name, amen. Here on Easter week, I want us to take a few moments to quiet our hearts and focus on the one who is at the very center of this special holiday and Holy Week. But really, his life should be at the center of all that we do. Philippians 2, 5 through 11, let me share these beautiful words with you. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the very form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, and he took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things of earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Now being a Southern Baptist minister, there's a great old time, very fiery Southern Baptist pastor named R.G. Lee. And he wrote some amazing words about Jesus. And I know I can't say them probably the way that he said them, but here's what R.G. Lee said. There was never another who caused all creation to be ransacked in pursuit of words appropriate to convey human hearts and minds his glorious preeminence. There was never another who was a human child and a divine son, who was wounded by Satan, and who at the same time crushed Satan, who was appointed the savior of men yet was also crucified by men, who was judge of men, yet was led as a felon from one tribunal to another. Truly, there was never another who died and was buried, yet lived again, who saved others, but himself he could not save, who had no sin in him, yet all sin was placed upon him, who was the king of glory, yet wore no crown but a crown of thorns, who in the glory he had before God and the world was, had the angelic hills of heaven, and yet on earth he gave himself to the murderous ways of men. There was never another who was the prince of life, he had died on Calvary's hill, who was as old as his heavenly father, and ages old than his earthly mother. Yet truly there was never another who was the victim of a Roman cross and a victor at a Jewish grave. There was never another who poured all the seas, all the lakes, all the rivers, out of the crystal chalice of eternity, yet on a cross with a mouth hot like a parched desert, cried out for rain, I thirst, 
I thirst. All of these beautiful words R.G. Lee wrote about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And our text tells us that God has given him a name that's above every name. So today, for our little devotion, I'd like for us to think about Jesus' life in three different moments. Three stages of time, if you might say. And those three stages of time are this. A cradle, a cross, and a crown. Just a couple of moments here at this beautiful lighthouse, we celebrated our birth of our Savior at Christmas. Jesus Christ was born in a humble major, common parents that he had. And while the birth of a child would normally be a cause for great rejoicing, the joy that that birth brought was to be short-lived. For you see, this child was born to die. Here lies in a manger, Emmanuel, God with us. Here lies God's greatest gift to mankind. Here lies the perfect sacrificial lamb. Here he lays, a baby born to die. But why, you might ask today, why was this baby born to die? The answer is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Christ died for our sins, your sins and mine. Those three little words is why that baby was there in a cradle, sin. And in the midst of sin, this sinful world was plunged the perfect sacrifice in the form of this baby named Jesus. For you see, the cradle emphasizes the Lord's humanity. Luke 2, chapter 7, not only points to his humanity, but it points to the humbleness of this little baby at the beginning of his birth. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The God of creation had chose to emphasize this Lord's birth as a very humble beginning. Beautiful sacred words say, being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. Our Savior truly was born in very humble beginnings. He had left the glory of heaven and his Father's side, and he was born as a baby in a simple manger to simple parents. But trust me, that was just one part of his story. For you see, on that night, a star shone very brightly of his birth, and if we look closely, we can also see that a cross was there. The cross, the second stage I'd like to point out for us. Jesus was born with the shadow of the cross upon him. With the shadow of the cross, he had learned to walk. He had learned to talk. He had learned to walk and work in his father's shop. The shadow was upon him all of his life. In Bethlehem swaddling clothes, on the walls of Nazareth's shop with his father, in Gethsemane's garden, when they came with lanterns and torches to arrest him, when Judas betrayed him with a kiss, when Caiaphas condemned him, when Herod mocked him, when Pilate condemned him, when the Romans scourged him with their whips, and when a Roman soldiers crucified him upon a cross. That was always upon his life. The cross, one of the truest, cruelest instruments of mankind, suspended between heaven and earth, the victim of the cross waited helplessly for death to come. It would only be a matter of hours as the victim looked forward to the arrival of death in order to achieve and relief of that awful pain and suffering. For death only came when a person could no longer push themselves up upon the spike that was driven through their feet, allowing them to take one more breath. Such finality is associated with the cross, just one way to come down from it, in the hands of those who had pointed to carry you to your grave. Such horror associated with the cross, the Hebrew writings say these words in the Old Testament, Cursed is the man who hangeth upon a tree. Any attempt I have today to truly get you to understand the cruelty and horror of the cross would prove very futile. For you see, the cross was hell on earth. It was a scene that would send shiver, shivers through the soul of a man. The cross was a terrible place of suffering, but it was also a beautiful place of sacrificing. Hebrews chapter 9.25 says this, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. There's that beautiful word again, sacrifice. It's deeply embedded throughout our holy scriptures. It's a word that goes back to the very first sacrifice when Abel offered his lamb before the Lord. Even before that, when God killed an animal so that he could clothe the nakedness of Adam and Eve. Throughout the Old Testament, especially as it pertained to the law, we see the beauty of sacrifice. Sacrifices of doves, of lambs, and more. All pointing to the one day beautiful sacrifice of God's own Son, the Lamb of God, on Calvary's hill. So please understand, Jesus, God's Son, was born under the shadow of a cross. It loomed before him all of his life at his greatest exploit. 
all the challenges of his life would wane in significance when compared to the challenges of the cross. Now he didn't relish this aside of it. Even in Gethsemane's garden, he had asked his father, let this cup pass from me. But he did not let it pass because he knew that was his father's will. I doubt if I'll ever understand the fullness of the awfulness of Christ's crucifixion. I would hope that you and I today in this Easter season would see it a little bit more clearly. The Apostle Paul said it this way, But God forbid that I should save in the glory of the cross of the Lord Jesus, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. I love the great words of the hymn writer who says it this way, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God, all the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. I would say today, thank God for the cross of Calvary upon which our freedom was purchased. And I thank God for the Christ of the cross of Calvary, upon who was the sacrificial lamb that all of the judgment was poured. So that leads me to my last point today, a cradle, a cross, and a crown. Calvary's cross was not the end. It was only the beginning. Make no mistake about it this Easter season, Christ is alive and he reigns. The Philippians passage that I read shares it this way, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and under the earth, that at the name and tongue of Jesus, everyone should confess that Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Christ is alive today and he's a conqueror. He never leads to defeat. There's a beautiful another hymn writer, Matthew Bridges, who said it this way, Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee and hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. The crown reminds us of Christ's sovereignty. The first crown that he came in war was a crown of thorns that was placed upon him at his crucifixion. But the Bible tells us very clearly that the next one that he wears will be a victor's crown when he comes again in all of his glory as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So before I close today, I would just like to share with you an amazing part of the scripture that Chaplain Vicky read for you something that some of us may not truly understand found in John chapter 20. And I'll look back with us together on some beautiful passages. But let me just focus on chapter 20, verses 5 through 7. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter, and he reached the tomb first. He bent over and he looked at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. So let me share with you what these words kind of mean for us today. We might kind of miss the meaning, but Peter and John would not have missed the meaning that day. It goes back to the idea of a master and a Jewish servant and at the home of that master. The servant would do the very best he could to prepare the dinner that evening for the master's ceremony. And he would wait nearby in the wings to see the cues that his master would leave for him about what was to be done next. If the master would wad up that napkin and place it aside, the servant would know that the master was done, that he had finished his meal, and he could begin to clear the table after the master had stood and his guests began to leave. But if the master folded up his napkin very nicely and he left it beside his plate, it meant that he was not finished with the dinner, that he would return. And so that servant saw that cue and he would wait for his master because he was not finished. Jesus in this beautiful passage here, John chapter 20, tells us that the cloth that covered his face was neatly there upon the stone. It reminded all of those that they would see the master again, that he was not finished, he was not done, he would return again. His life wasn't finished, his plan for mankind was not finished. 
His plan for redemption was not finished. His plan for you was not finished as well. So let me say, if you're searching for Jesus today, don't look in the cradle. That cradle is empty. If you're searching for Jesus today, don't look upon a cross, for he is no longer there. If you seek the Lord this day, don't stoop and peer into an empty tomb, for it is forever vacant, a memorial to our resurrected Savior and Lord. For he came as a baby to a cradle, but he now wears a crown. The cross was once an object of shame and ridicule, but now he has become a symbol of his glory. Please don't miss him this Easter. He's alive, and he loves you and me very much. Will you join me as we pray together? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the beautiful time together today to virtually celebrate this Easter service. And Father, we know there's difficulty and uncertainty in our world, but Father, you have reigned victorious and conquered the cross and the grave. And Father, today we can find hope in you. We can put our trust in you, that you love us and that you care for us. That, Father, you are working all things for our good according to your plan and purpose. So, Father, I pray for our world today. Help us to trust in you. Help us to put our trust and hope in you each and every day. So, Father, bless us this Easter season. Help us in our spiritual journey to remember that you are the Lamb of God who has taken away the sins of the world. Father, that cross, uh, you are no longer there. That grave is forever empty. And God, your plan and purpose for our lives is still being worked out. And so, Father, we thank you for that. We ask this prayer today in your Son's holy name. Amen. We thank you today for joining us as we celebrated this Easter service online. It was a pleasure for the few of us to be gathered here at the historic Diamond Head Lighthouse to put this together for you. And I will echo back to the words of our Admiral here. If you're uh, this uh, Easter season suffering, looking for hope and for peace in your life, we hope that you will continue to put your trust in a God who cares about you and loves you and who wants the very best for you. So you are not alone. We uh, care about you. Uh, we want the very best for you, and so we hope that you enjoyed this service and your spirit was uplifted uh, this special Easter year. And we will look back on it and remember how faithful God has been to each one of us. And so thank you. God bless.